morning. Are you guys awake yet? Let's go. Come on. I'm feeling, a, I, I'm feeling like y'all need the joy of the Lord down deep in your soul here. Yeah, how are you doing? Really? Just nothing. Good luck, Mike. Mike, you're going to have to preach. Uh, I'll do my best to kind of open them up here. You know what? Why don't, why don't we start with prayer? Should we start with prayer? That, that will require a little less, you know, clapping and energy and all that. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the joy that, that you give, that, that fountain of joy that, that never, never, ever ceases, never runs out. Lord, as long as we seek you, we will find you. We will find your presence, and in your presence, we will find joy. God, what a privilege it is to stand here in this room. What a privilege it is that we get to stand in your presence. What a privilege it is that we get to encounter you. Holy Spirit, be with us now. As we enter your throne room, as we enter the spirit of uh, this, this place of prayer, this place of worship, we give you this morning. Lord, we just ask for an anointing over this room this morning. God, it is our privilege to worship you and praise you. And all God's people said, amen.
Yes.
child of God. Yes, I Jesus, you said that you would go and you'd prepare a place for us. What a place that must be. What a place that must be. Lord, as we stand in your presence, we catch such a small glimpse of what that glory must be. Lord, we just pray that you would continue to reveal yourself. We are chosen. We are chosen by you. Lord, we are just so undeserving of it. Of all the wrong that I've done, you continue to just share your, just pour out your grace over us. Heavenly Father, as, as we continue to worship this morning, Lord, we pray that we would have a spirit of openness. to receive all that you have in store for us. To be able to give all that, all that we are able to give. Lord, I sense that there is a, uh, there is reservation in the room this morning, for sure. Sometimes it's hard to make ourselves vulnerable. But God, if we were perfect the way that we were, there would be no need for a Savior. And Lord, we know that that is not true. Lord, we need you. We need you. Lord, we are sorry for the places in which we do come up short. We're sorry for the places in which we are reserved when you ask us to be open. So Holy Spirit, with your power, I just pray that you would break those chains right now. God, as we go into our offering this morning, we just pray, uh, pray for our church in this season of transition that we are in. God, we pray that uh, that your hand would just be in it, just be here. Lord, give us a spirit of worship as we place this offering. You may be seated.
of thrones and dominions of powers and positions. Your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are lifted high, Holy, you're holy for morning we have spent so much of our time singing about your joy and how you are holy, how you are our God, how you prepare a room for us, how we are who you say that we are. And Lord God, may we de delight in that. May that be our heart's joy this morning. And no matter what our week was like, Lord God, that we may find hope in that, that that is good news, that that can bring a smile to our face. But we know that sometimes people come into this space, this space. This is just a room, Lord God. We know that, but we come into this space with lots of things on our hearts. Maybe there's there's kids here who have had a rough week in school or are feeling stressed about school and about testing and find it hard to sit in class. Maybe there's adults who also feel that it's hard to focus at work or 
there's relationship problems or there's problems at home or money problems or, or even bigger than some of that. Lord God, whatever is on our hearts this morning, your church is here crying to you and we are saying that you are good and you are holy and that we love you, Lord God, and that you may just be the king of our heart, that you can sit on the throne of our heart, Lord God, that you can teach us how to love you with just that reckless abandon, Lord God. We love you, and Holy Spirit, thank you for being in this place. May we just continue to open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds, open our eyes to what you have in store for us this morning. Thank you, Lord God, for bringing us here. It is by no accident that we are here together in this space. We love you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Allie, and um, I go to go to church here. I'm on the worship team, um, and I get to share some announcements with you this morning. Are they supposed to sit for announcements? You can sit. Okay. Yes, yeah, somebody else said yes. Yes. Uh, so, hold on. Let me grab my shoes. I will tell you, if you are a woman, you are in luck because pretty much all the announcements are for women, but men don't tune out, okay? All right, so um, first thing that we have is that you may have noticed there's this lovely table at the back. Um, Rita will be back there after service this morning um, telling you a little bit more about moms in prayer. There's some information in the bulletin about that, and it's just a group of moms that get together and, and pray, and they pray for our church, pray for our families, just pray. And so it looks like they meet on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. If that's something that you are able to join in, awesome. If, if you can't because maybe you work during that time or you have other commitments, then maybe it's Something just to keep in the back of your mind. Oh, at 10 o'clock, maybe I can say a prayer too, right? But um, go ahead and chat with Rita after church, and she'll give you some more information about that. Also, tomorrow night, Mom Squad is meeting at 6:30. Um, there's a spring craft, a spring salad supper. Mom Squad is a really great time if you're able to join that, even if you've never been before it's okay. Please come and join. You will always be welcomed. Um, there is this other great little, I don't know, flyer, I guess you can say, um, for a ladies high tea. And it's going to be a lot of fun. May 4th at 4 p.m. at at, at church here. Um, there's going to be a high tea, and it looks like we get to dress up, dress kind of fancy. Um, I remember as a child, my mom always had in like the corner curio, she had like my mom, my grandma's and my great grandma's like teacups, and I could never touch them. And I always wanted to drink out of them. And one time I snuck and I t like poured a bunch of milk in it, and I had milk and cookies in my grandma's teacups, and my mom was not impressed. Um, but my mom's going to come, and it, I can drink tea, I guess, not milk and cookies, but maybe maybe Carrie will bring milk and cookies for me. We'll see. Um, but that is on May 4th, and so check that out. Um, and then also, this is also for the men and women and everyone in this church. Um, I know that maybe a week or a couple weeks ago, Brian had chatted a little bit about the transitions that our, our church is starting to go through um, as, as Brian is stepping down as our lead pastor. And I would just really encourage all of you, especially small groups who are meeting together, community groups, to really keep that transition process in prayer in our church and really just be praying for that. Whether you pray at the beginning, you pray at the end, you pray throughout your time, um, really encourage you to please just to spend some time praying as a group. And if you're not in a community group, then you yourself, please spend some time praying for our church and for um, all decisions that will be made, just that there's wisdom in all of that and guidance and all of that. So with that, that is the announcements that I have. Kids, you can stand up and walk to Kids Church. Thanks. And the rest of you can stand up and, and greet and welcome each other this morning.
Well, good morning. Looks like some of you haven't seen each other for years. Uh, yesterday, just by a show of hands, how many here were doing yard work? Right? Now, let's be real honest, okay? How many good North Dakotans in here out doing your yard work had it cross your mind, oh, man, it's hot out here? Yeah, right? I even complained a little bit. Hey, winter's coming, you guys. Don't worry. You know? <laughs> so good to be with you today. And, man, it's, it's just a fun time of year where you get things cleaned up and you get things back in order. And, um, and even as we're in this series, um, my hope is, is that, like, not just our yards, not just our homes, but in this transition that we're in as a church, um, that, man, we would just make sure that our hearts are in order, that our hearts are in tune with Him, and we would really say, Thy kingdom come. In the midst of all that's going on right now, that we would just be set, that we're living in God's kingdom and not our own. I, uh, I find it interesting, the older I get, um, the simpler I become. Now, let me explain. When I was, when I was young in ministry... Um, I was, uh, you know, full of fire and vinegar. I, I was telling somebody this morning that I would have like 14 pages of notes on my sermon, and my sermon would be like seven minutes long, you know. And uh, I would start in Genesis, and we'd wrap it up in Revelation, you know. And, and, and when I was young, I, I was always impressed, you know. The, the pastors always stand at the back of the service on the way out, you know, we just want to catch everybody on the way out, and, you know, it's just some honest, like, confession time for a pastor. You know, it's, it's always nice to get a compliment every once in a while. Can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah, see, you're all pretty weak on that, you know, but, you know, and every once in a while you'd get a complaint, you know, like, you feel like, man, you just preached a great message, and then somebody found something in the service they didn't like, you know, and... And, and that just, that's what happens in the church world for whatever reason. And, and I can remember when I was younger, I'd be standing at the back shaking people's hands. And, man, I worked hard on a message. And, and I wanted to, like, just wow them with, like, you know, the Greek language and deep theology. And, and I can remember people walking through the back, and they would come up to me and shake my hand and say, Oh, Pastor, that was deep. And my chest would puff up. And I'd say, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, that was deep. And then the next week, I would work even that much harder. I wanted, I wanted something deep, you know, be because we've all heard this in the church, right? That in all my ministry, maybe it's just me. Maybe I just heard it way too often. But, but I'd have people leave the church, and, and many times your excuse would be something like, well, we're just not being fed, you know? And everything in me would want to say, well, just go get a sandwich, you know, <laughs> like you're an adult. <laughs> and, and I'd hear these things, but, but when people would say, oh, that was deep, it'd feel really good. And so the next week, you know, I'd work really hard at, you know, man, I'm just going to wow them. I'm going to blow them out of the water, you know. And, and I can remember my first church that I had in Carrington, North Dakota. Yeah, some Carrington people here, right? They never went to my church. <laughs> Carrington, North Dakota. You know, I, I had my first Sunday, I'll never forget, it was like 19 people in my service, you know? And like four of them were from my family. And, and I can remember like just wowing these 19 people with a deep theological message and people walk up like, oh, pastor. We haven't had deep messages like this in years. And I think, well, I'm a special guy, you know. And but then I discovered something. Many times, these, these same people that would get excited about going deep, the next week had like a serious complaint about something that I thought was so frivolous and so meaningless. And, and maybe because... I wasn't quite right where I should be, and maybe they weren't quite right where they should be. And, and then all of a sudden, there was friction. And then all of a sudden, we wouldn't see eye to eye on things. I, 
over the years have tried to be a student of God's Word and learn as much as I can and study as much as I can. And, and you'd sit down with some people and, and you'd want to go deep with them. And then the older I got, you know what I discovered? It's like Jesus took all these deep things, these complicated things, and he shows up and he ushers in his kingdom. And the way he describes it and the way he talks about it, throughout the Gospels, the way he says, like, hey, listen, guys, my kingdom is like, he simplifies it so much to where ordinary people like me and ordinary people like you can grasp what it means to live in his kingdom. You see, I feel like we've complicated so much of it. And in our process and desire to go deep, I think sometimes Jesus every once in a while throws a wrench into it and says, hey, listen, let me simplify this for you. You see, we mentioned this last week, like, like God's kingdom is as simple as is when God is in control of our lives. When God is, in the, God is on the throne of our lives. In fact, the Lord's prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This idea of God's kingdom is, is when his will is being done right here on this planet, right here and now. Like we don't have to wait till we get to the other side. Like God ushers in his kingdom into our lives today and it's taking place all around us. The challenge that we have is, is our human nature is always fighting against that kingdom, isn't it? We're constantly resisting his kingdom and, and we're trying to make it about our kingdom because the reality is, is every one of us in this place are, are settling into some kind of kingdom. We're making a residence in some kind of kingdom. You see, oftentimes our kingdom is all about us, right? It's all about us. It's all about our wants. It's all about our desires. But yet, God's kingdom is all about Him and others. Our kingdom is all about being comfortable, right? <laughs> but God's kingdom is all about picking up your cross. Our kingdom is all about storing up all that you can and gathering all that you can. And God's kingdom is all about giving it away. Our kingdom is all about power and position. And God's kingdom is all about forgiveness, racial reconciliation, making relationships right, serving each other, and washing other people's feet. And it's interesting, like even in the church, we wrestle with this, don't we? We say with our lips, sometimes out of obligation or out of ritual or routine, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, but do we mean it? Because even in the church, like we wrestle with our kingdoms, what we want and what we're trying to establish. And Jesus comes and he teaches us what the kingdom is all about when he's on the throne, when his will really is done. And we come to this neat passage of scripture in Luke chapter 18. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke 18. And this cracks me up as we usher kids out of the service, but don't take that as... I'm against children's church because I had three of my own. Luke 18, 15 through 17 says this. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, <laughs> anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. 
Now, I've been told most of my life, Mike, you need to grow up. <laughs> Mike, you need to quit acting like a child. Maybe, just maybe, my wife said that to me last week. But the idea is we always need to grow up, and here Jesus kind of turns it upside down, doesn't he? In fact, in Matthew 18, he says, hey, listen, unless you change, some of your translations say, unless you become converted and become like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so I think it's good for us to like pause this morning and, and maybe have some fun about looking back at what was it like to be a child. Because Jesus himself says, hey, listen, unless you become like a child or unless you accept the kingdom like a child, you can never enter it. And so maybe this morning we ought to just reminisce on what it was like to be a child. Now, I understand this, that some of you grow up and you have memories as a child that aren't good. And, and so even like trying to apply this is a challenge for you. But, but the reality is, is there's a biblical structure in the home that was always meant to be. There was a, a structure of a family that was always meant to be. And, and sin often messes that up. And so what we're going to look at is, is maybe you're going to look at your childhood, but, but what should have childhood looked like? For you. Now, for some of you, it's going to be hard, right? Because we got to go way back, don't we? I grew up in Mandan, North Dakota. How many by a show of hands are Mandan people? That's right. You guys like fire up your hands right away. You even have a scowl when you do it. Like, yeah, Mandan, you know? It's funny, there's a guy here, and I'm not going to point him out. There's a guy here who I was scared to death of when I was a kid in Mandan. He would walk down the hall, and I would put my head down and not look him in the eyes. And a few years ago, him and I got reunited, and God's doing some amazing things in his life, and he's a Mandan guy through and through, and I love him, and he's here. I'll try to find him after the service. But I grew up in Mandan, and, and I had a good childhood. There were seven of us kids, and, and we grew up 3908 35th Avenue Northwest, Mandan, North Dakota. We lived over by Cloverdale Foods, and I grew up where there was empty lots, and there was lots of space where kids could play baseball and football, and we could go on great adventures. And, and as it began to get dark, we would wait for it. My mom would whistle as soon as it would get dark, and, and it didn't matter. We could be like clear across town, and we could hear mom's whistle, you know. And wherever we were at, we would, we would come home because we knew it was time to come home because mom would whistle. And, and as I look back at my childhood, I have to admit that, that things have changed drastically in the world today, and, and maybe some things about children are different today. For example, I was on a plane this week. I was down in Arizona most of the week for work. And uh, you know how it is when, you, when you're trying to get off a plane and you're sitting like near the back of the plane? It just seems to take forever to get off the plane and people start to get a little bit like they're, they're itching to get off. And, and there's a family behind me who's like kids were bouncing off the ceiling the whole flight. You know, they were like wild and out of control. And I, and I kept thinking like, oh, I'm glad I'm past that stage, you know. And, and, and I can remember when, when we stood up and, and we were all trying to get in the aisles and trying to get our luggage out and walk down the hall. One of these boys was like, was, was just really loud and, and yelling about he wants to get off the plane and why won't people hurry up. And, and the dad said, hey, listen, you need to settle down. <laughs> and the kid said, no, they need to hurry up. And I can remember thinking like, oh, boy, because <laughs> I know what my dad would have done, you know, <laughs> like, I told you this, my mom had the quickest backhand in Mandan, North Dakota. She could backhand all seven of us kids in a split second. You wouldn't even know where it came from, you know? And I can remember as a kid, like, like there were consequences, and, you know, and I can remember this kid behind me was like, oh, no. And then the dad said, well, come on now, settle down. And he just as loud as could be, Dad, you're mean. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, you know? 
And eventually, I'm starting to be like, all right, I'm going to take care of this, you know. I didn't. But I look back at my childhood, and, and, and I look at, you know, my relationship with my mom and my relationship with my dad and, and how that family was structured and, and what it looked like. And, and I, I, want to, I want us to kind of apply some of that stuff to what Jesus was talking about because I think it's so significant. Because he, he calls us to have this childlike faith. In fact, he says, listen, you guys, you, <laughs> to his disciples, like, hey, listen, I know, I know you, you don't want the kids to come in. They're noisy. They're obnoxious. They smell funny, you know, and, you know. But Jesus says, listen, you adults, you need to learn something. In my kingdom, you have to have this childlike faith. Now, what does that look like? Uh, what does that mean in our, in our everyday lives? And so today I just want us to kind of reminisce on our childhoods. What was it like to be a child? And, and then how can we apply that into entering into his kingdom? A place where there's love or forgiveness. A place where we take care of each other. A place where we take care of the poor place where there's no room for hate. How do we enter into his kingdom like a child? First thing I thought of when I was working on this is we enter his kingdom with humility and dependence. We enter his kingdom with humility and dependence. I can remember coming home from school in Mandan. And again, running away from bullies. <laughs> You know, being so stressed out going to school. I went to Mandan Junior High, the old junior high. The one that looked like a prison and felt like a prison. I went to that school and, and I was kind of a nerdy little kid. And I can remember being so stressed out at, at school and, you know, just trying to avoid certain people in the hallways and just trying to get by every day and just trying to get through the day. And I can remember coming home from school and how nice it was to come into the, to my home. And you know what the first thing we would yell when we were home? When we'd walk through the door? Mom, are you home? And it was such a beautiful... My, my mom was, was a home mom. She stayed at home. She didn't work outside the home. And so it was so nice as a child to come home and, and know that mom was home. Now, dads, just to be honest, if mom didn't say she was home, we didn't hear anything from mom, and we heard dad say something like, nope, I'm home, we were like, oh, no, <laughs> what are we going to eat, <laughs> you know, <laughs> are we going to survive, you know, but when we would come home, there was just this beautiful noise when mom would say she was home because we knew this, we could depend on her. We knew that we would be taken care of. We knew that our needs would be met. We could come in and we knew that everything was going to be okay because mom was home. And all joking aside, we felt that way about dad as well. There was something about a child coming in with humility, knowing that we can't survive without mom and dad. I can remember when my daughter was young. My daughter's going to be home from school in two weeks. Can't wait. She's informed me that it's her last summer home. So we're going to take advantage of it. But when my daughter was little, she had this curly hair. And I grew up most of my life with all brothers. I didn't know what to do with hair. My daughter had this curly hair and and it was just wild, and, and mom took care of it. You know, mom washed it, and mom combed it, and mom did things with it, and mom made it look all nice. And I can remember once my little girl, mom was gone for the weekend, and, and, and I was watching her, and I can remember walking by the bathroom and my little girl looking in the mirror. And I could hear her say, well, I guess this is the way it's going to be. <laughs> she was totally dependent on us. 
You see, I'm, I'm convinced of this in our relationship with the Heavenly Father. Like as we enter into His kingdom, it's this idea of like, listen, I come to you humbly. I can't do this on my own. I'm totally dependent on you. I need you to be my resource. I need you to feed me. I need you to give me my daily bread. I am totally dependent on you. You see, I love what Jesus says. Jesus says later to his disciples, like, hey, listen, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I think when, when we enter into his kingdom, if, if we have this mindset of like, well, listen, I, I can do this on my own. We can't enter his kingdom. You see, we come into his kingdom with this childlike mentality that says, listen, you're God and I'm not. You're God and I am not. And apart from you, I can do nothing. So my challenge for us today is, like, are you that dependent on him? Or you just wake up in the morning and say, listen, I need you today. Oh, I need you. Going to work every day, it's a challenge for me. Man, I'm, I'm struggling just getting by, and, and you know my marriage situation, my family situation. Listen, I'm totally dependent on you. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. You see, to enter his kingdom, you have to come with humbleness. In this heart of I'm totally dependent on you. As I continue to think about this, what it means to come into his kingdom with this childlike attitude is we have to enter his kingdom with a healthy fear, don't we? Let me explain that. We have to enter his kingdom with this healthy fear. Now, I knew my parents loved me. I knew my home was a safe place for me. But I had a healthy fear of my father. Now, that doesn't mean I was scared of my father. I wasn't. It doesn't mean that I walked around my home with fear and trembling, thinking dad was going to snap. And I know some of you experienced that. I didn't. And so whenever I talk about fear, I talk about a healthy fear. Like, I knew there were consequences if I crossed the line. Here's an example. There was five of us boys, and we all had egos. We were all like, you know, I joked about this. We had cold winters in North Dakota, so we're all like a year apart. Um, and we played well together, but we also fought together. And, and I can remember at times where me and my brothers, we'd get into these fights, and it would start with just bickering, right? It start with bickering, but we're brothers, and so eventually it would like, you know, chests would go out, and then it'd start to shove, and then next thing you know, like, we're throwing fists, you know, because we grew up in Mandan. That's how we did things, you know? I became civilized and moved to Bismarck. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I still love Mandan. But, but I'll never forget, we'd be down in the basement, and we would just be throwing punches and and my mom would, would yell down in the basement because she wasn't going to go down there. Boys, take that outside. I'm like, great idea, mom. And so we'd go outside and go in the front yard and we'd start, you know, throwing fists. And then my mom would be panicking. The neighbors are watching, you know, get in the house. And, and, and I can remember one time in particular, my brother was on top of me. And my brother is a big 6'5 guy, big, stronger than I am. And, and he was just wailing on me. And I couldn't do anything. My arms were pinned, but I had a mouth on me. So I could keep shooting off my mouth. And, <laughs> and kids, this is bad. Don't do it. Okay? We've repented of this. But I can remember my brother would pop me in the head and everything would go black. And then it would come back to again. And then I would say something again, you know. And, and my mom was at the top of the stairs saying, Kelly was my brother. Hope he's watching today. She'd say, Kelly, you're going to kill him. 
get off of them, you know, and, I'm, you know, and I keep mouthing off. But then mom did something that almost always worked. I'm going to call your father. And you know what happened immediately? We would stop. Because we knew that when we crossed that line and dad had to come home, there would be serious consequences. And so my whole upbringing, I didn't mouth off to my dad. I didn't back talk to my dad. If my dad told me to do something, I did it. Because I had this healthy fear of there's consequences when you don't do what you're supposed to do. Now, this is challenging for us in God's kingdom, isn't it? But God calls us to have a fear for him. And I don't believe it's like a, a fear and trembling and I'm afraid of God, but, but I believe this. In God's kingdom, when, when we don't live the way he calls us to live, there's consequences for that. There's consequences for our sin. There's consequences for us not doing the things that he wants us to do. And I'm just going to be honest with you, and, and, and I'm not going to argue this with anybody, and I'm not saying this is like from deep biblical studies that I've had, but, but I can't help but think that the rumblings that's going on in our nation today is because we're seeing consequences of a Christian nation not living the way he wants us to live. And we're seeing the consequences of it today. And so I think as a, a follower of Christ who wants to come into his kingdom like a child, it's not this, like, I'm scared of you. It's just like, listen, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to live the way you want me to live. And I know this, when, when I don't, when I stray from that, there's consequences. Not because you want to punish me, but because you love me. And I knew this about my earthly father, like, like when there were consequences. It was all because he loved me and he wanted me to do well in this world. And I can't help but think of our heavenly father. <laughs> He wants us to thrive in his kingdom. He wants us to do well, not in our kingdom or our, our standards, but he wants us to do well in his kingdom. And so whenever we get outside of that, there's consequences. And, and so we always have to evaluate, like, what are those things going on around us? What are some of those struggles that maybe we're having or, or maybe some of those things that that just seem to be like disrupting our lives right now, I think we always have to evaluate, God, are, are we living the way you want us to live? Are we approaching your kingdom like a child? It says, listen, I want to live the way you want me to live. I want to interact with people the way you want me to interact with people. I want to be the man or woman that you intended me to be living in your kingdom. And lastly, as I thought about this, not only do we enter his kingdom with humility and dependence or enter his kingdom with a healthy fear, this is some really good news for us today. We enter his kingdom trusting that he can do anything and everything. We enter his kingdom with this attitude of, God, you're big. God, you can do anything. God, you're, you're so grand and so glorious and, and whatever circumstance comes my way, I can give it to you and you can take care of it. Because God, you can do anything and everything. You know why I can think about that about my Heavenly Father? It's because we at one time thought about that about our earthly fathers, didn't we? See, from the time I was little... I was convinced that my dad could fix anything. If a toy was broken, I could bring it to dad. And dad would attempt to fix it. And I was convinced he could fix it. I could come to mom with a bruise and knew that mom would take care of that owie that I had. 
as I got older, I began to call my dad when the car would break down. <laughs> I can remember when I was in college. My parents were in North Dakota, and I was in Chicago, Illinois. I remember calling my dad because I was in the middle of Chicago, and my pickup truck broke down, and I called my dad, and I said, Dad, my truck broke down. You know what his response was? What do you want me to do about it? <laughs> you know? But I called him because I was convinced Dad would know what to do, and he did. Dad talked me through what I needed to do. I can remember the first time when I was at college and I was sick. You know who I called? Not dad. <laughs> called mom. Mom, I'm sick. And mom knew what to do. And I knew mom would know what to do. It's so funny. Here I am, a 46-year-old adult. And I still call my dad with things like my vehicle call my dad for things that are going on in my family. I call my dad when things aren't working at my house. I call my dad, you know why? Because one time we were convinced dad was Superman. Dad could do anything and everything. I can remember down the street in Mandan, North Dakota, sitting with a group of kids, convincing them that my dad could beat up their dad. What a disappointment it was when I discovered that my dad probably couldn't. <laughs> but dad was Superman. Dad can do anything. When I'm having a tough day, you call dad. When the windshield gets cracked, I call dad. And I know what to do, but I still call dad. Because I'm convinced that dad can do anything and everything. I think one of the best things I can convince people of today is that's the kind of Heavenly Father we have. We have a Heavenly Father that can do anything and everything. The things that you wrestle with in your home, we have a Heavenly Father that can help you through it. The financial struggles that you're wrestling with today, we have a Heavenly Father that can help you through that. The health issues that you just struggle with every day, we have a Heavenly Father that can help you with that. Whatever is going on in your life today that just seems heavy and overwhelming, we serve a God who can do anything and everything. And also, too often in this life, we try to fix things on our own. We try to put the pieces back together on our own. All the while, Jesus says, listen, if you want to be part of my kingdom, come to me like a child. And so we go to him with everything. God, you know the things going on in my life. I believe this. You can do anything and everything. Would you help my marriage? Would you help me as a parent? <laughs> Would you help me with my career? Would you help me with school? And it comes back to our, our first thing as a child, like we get to this place where we just become so convinced that he can do anything and everything that we become totally dependent on him. So my question for you is, what are those things weighing heavy in your life today? Does it keep you up at night? Are, are you overwhelmed with fear and anxiety? I say this with all humility and, and saying it with because I creep into this often. Maybe, just maybe, you're settling too much in your kingdom. All the while, you have a God who says, listen, when my kingdom comes, I'm a God who can do anything and everything. Not always the way you want it, <laughs> but always what's best. And so just trust me. So my challenge for our church today is maturing in your faith 
means you become more childlike in your faith. You want to go deeper in your faith? Become more childlike in your faith. Because Jesus tells us, Luke 18, 17, Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child, like a little child, will never enter it. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this challenge today. Some of us wrestle with this. I do. <laughs> but I think collectively we mean this. We want your kingdom to come. We want your will to be done around us. And we want to be citizens in your kingdom, not kingdoms that we established or other people established. We want to be citizens in your kingdom. And, and so you remind us today to, to enter your kingdom like a child. So teach us today what it means to be a child. Help us be totally dependent on you. Help us have this healthy fear of who you are. God, we believe this. You're a God who can do anything and everything. So help us put our trust in that. Help us put our faith in you. And God, in this next week, we're going to have things creep into our lives that are going to challenge those very things. We're going to try to step up and be adults. <laughs> we're going to try to grow up. But even this week, when circumstances come our way, whether it's health, finances, family issues, work issues, whatever it might be, Teach us what it means to be a child and enter into your kingdom like a child. We love you, Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every heart proclaims the glory of your name on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And every heart proclaims the glory of your name. On earth as it is in heaven. of salvation was only the start now I am chosen free and forgiven I have a future and it's worth the living I was in late, tend in a grave, I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. I was meant for more. So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I. No who I
Almighty God be with you. Holy Spirit, cover you. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Because I was in mates, pretending.